thank you for your prayers and inquiries concerning my knee. Uh, it is progressing uh, appropriately, I think. Uh, still stiff enough and sore enough that I don't want to be on my feet constantly for very long. So I'm uh, taking this approach of sitting as we think together about God's Word. Thanks for your forbearance. Turn in your Bibles, please, first of all, to Psalm 40, verses 4 through 10. Psalm 40, verses 4 through 10. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust and does not respect the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Many, O Lord my God, are your wonderful works which you have done, and your thoughts toward us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I would declare and speak of them, they're more than can be numbered. Sacrifice and offering you do not desire. My ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you do not require. Then I said, Behold, I come. In the scroll of the book it's written of me, I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is in my heart. I have proclaimed the good news of righteousness in the great assembly. Indeed, I do not restrain my lips, O Lord, you yourself know. I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I have declared your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your hesed and your truth, your loving kindness and your truth from the great assembly. And then to Matthew chapter 21, verses 28 to 33. Matthew 21, 28 to 33. What do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward he regretted it and went. Then he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said to him, The first. Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. We end at verse 32. About 50 years ago, a professor at the University of Chicago, named Henri Frankfurt, wrote these words. The Bible replaces the myth of nature with the myth of the will of God. Now, we may quibble with him about the meaning of that word myth. He's using it in the sense of the ruling understanding of reality. But if we quibble with him about the use of the word myth, he still has the point correct. At the core of biblical faith is the idea of a God who has a will for his creation. Paganism, oh no. The gods have no will except their own survival and pleasure and using us to those ends. But God... The God of the Bible has a purpose for His creatures. And that's what I want to think about with you today, the will of God. And I want to ask three questions. What do we mean by the will of God? What is God's will? And does God have a particular will for you and me? What do we mean by the will of God? 
What is God's will? And does God have a particular will for you and me? What do we mean when we talk about God's will? Well, think about the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come. What is God's will? What is the basis of God's will? It is His kingship in the world. Because He is the King, Jesus says, therefore, His will ought to be accomplished as thoroughly on earth as it is in heaven. If God's will is done in your life and in mine and on this earth, then His kingship is affirmed. So the question is, is He the King in our lives? To belong to this King is to do His will. In the book of Acts, chapter 13, Paul is commenting on that phrase from the Old Testament, David is a man after God's own heart. And Paul's comment is, a man who will do all my will. Sometimes I think we get, oh, a man after God's own heart. He was all sentimental about God. He felt all fuzzy about Him. He was really happy and nice. Paul has it right. To have the heart of God in my heart is to do what He wants. To do His will. You see the same thing in that passage that we read from Matthew. Which is the truly loving son? Oh yeah, Dad, I'll go. No, Dad, I'm not going to do it. Which son did the Father's will? The one who went. (laughs) To belong to the King is to do His will. And then, in some ways, what I find one of the most frightening statements in Scripture, Jesus' words, on the last day, it will not be those who say to Me, Lord, Lord but those who did My will will be those who enter in to their eternal reward. Here then is the great crisis point of the world. Who is the King in your life? Who is the King in my life? Who has the right to say, do this? And we'll do it. All the religious experiences in the world are worthless if we won't do what God wants when it comes down to the bottom line. It's so clear in Jesus' life. The disciples came back with lunch from downtown Samaria. And they said, Jesus, why aren't you eating? And He said, My food is to do the will of the Father who sent Me. That adds a new perspective. Who is this King? Mm, He's the Father. Not simply the austere monarch who says, do what I say or I'm going to get you. But the Father who holds out His arms to us and says, oh son, daughter, here's what I want you to do. And Jesus says, that's my food. Later on, in the very next chapter of the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I don't seek my own will. 
but that of the Father who sent me. That sense of having been sent to do what Daddy asked. That sense of being appointed, called, runs right through Jesus' life and ministry. They said to Him, Jesus, Jesus, your mother and brothers are outside. Your family's outside. And Jesus says in that frighteningly blunt way of His, you want to see my family? These twelve knuckleheads who are doing my will. And of course, in that dark night in the garden, not my will, but yours. Whatever it costs, whatever it takes. And so you have those words that are quoted in Hebrews from the psalm. How can you characterize the life of the Savior? I delight to do your will. And then those amazing words, He was perfected by His obedience. How in the world can the second person of the Trinity be perfected? He could only come to His true potential. He could only come to the fulfillment of His personhood in the Trinity through joyful obedience to the Father. Now friends, if Jesus could only come to His true potential, if He could only come to all that He was made for through obedience, how do you and I think we're going to get off with less? Oh, the great problem today as in the Garden of Eden is not ignorance. It is simply rebellion. I know what you want and I'm not going to do it. Some of you who have been in class with me have, have heard me use this illustration before. I grew up on a farm. I have no problem in believing that nature is fallen with us humans. I have watched a cow stretch her neck between two strands of barbed wire to get a milkweed on the other side when the pasture where she was was full of milkweeds. Why did she want that one? Simply because it was off limits. (laughs) Tell me what I'm supposed to do so I can know what I'm not going to (laughs) do. Tell me what I'm not supposed to do, so I'll know what I'm going to do. Deep, deep in the human heart is that rebelliousness that says, whatever you want, I want the opposite. And so, there must come a point for every one of us where we say, I surrender. I give up. (laughs) My life is yours. Lock, stock, and barrel. Top to bottom. Inside out. I will do your will. God's will is His kingly rule and His fatherly right. So, what are the details? What is it that the king wants? What is it that the father desires? He does not will that any should be lost. God's will as Paul expresses it in Ephesians, is to gather everything up in Christ so that we all will become heirs of heaven. That's God's will. 
I hear people again and again across these many years saying, well, I just don't know what God's will for my life is. Hogwash. I know what God's will for your life is. God's will for your life is that you should be seeking to save the lost. That's a no-brainer, folks. (laughs) So how do you and I see those around us? And if I point one finger at you, I'm pointing three at myself. Do we see them as lost? Do we see them as desperately in need of the Savior? Or do we forget? The Father's will is that none should be lost. Now, He has different gifting. I understand that. It was, it was a great relief for me on the day when I thought about the fact that a great evangelist whom I was trying to model myself on and failing pretty desperately had, before he was converted, been a million dollar a year life insurance salesman. I say that was a great relief for me. I'm not a salesman. But that doesn't let me out of the Father's will. There are many ways in which we need to be seeking the lost. Many ways in which you and I need to be involved and can be involved in the task of winning the world for Christ. His will is that none should be lost. His will is that we should be like Him. What's the Torah all about? And Paul says it. If you know the Torah, you know His will. There shall be no rival to me in your life. Nothing else that could possibly stand up against the fulfillment of the King's will in my life. I've always loved the line that I heard several years ago. I never realized that two coon dogs and a shotgun were bigger than God until He asked for them. No other gods... keeping His name and His nature and His prerogatives central in our lives. Christian, the name of Christ is upon you. What do your neighbors think of Christ? When we talk about not making His name appear empty, we're not merely talking about a casual oath. We're talking about His nature and His character as seen in our lives. Don't ever forget the Torah teaches us you are a gift. That's what honoring your father and your mother are all about. Just remembering (laughs) you didn't make yourself. (laughs) If you ever meet a self-made man, you met a liar. (laughs) Not one of us is self-made. Every one of us is a gift. Cherishing your neighbor's possessions. Life. Name. Sexuality. God wants us to be like Him. And in the end, don't ever believe that more things will satisfy the craving in your soul. That's God's will. His will is that we should be holy as He is holy. 
You want to know what God's will for your life is? There it is. He does not will that any should be lost. And He wills that every one of us should be like Him, an heir of heaven. And so, none of us will ever realize God's purpose for our lives until we have fought and lost the battle of the will. Soren Kierkegaard, the Danish theologian, said it so very well. Purity of heart is to will one thing. Now, is that over and over again? Is it every day we wake up and say, I wonder if I'll do God's will today. I wonder if God will win or lose in my life today. Hmm. I wonder what the outcome's going to be today. Or can that battle be fought in such a climactic way that though each new day brings its challenges, the outcome is foreordained. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Thank God. Oh, don't ever think that if you indeed have lost the battle of His will in that great climactic way, there will be no more struggle. Of course there will be. But the outcome can be foreordained. A friend of mine told me of an experience of his. He said, I sat in the back of an auditorium and I saw something happen on the platform which spelled the end to one of my great dreams. And I sat there grieving and sorrowing. And then I heard God say, I I thought you gave your future to me 15 years ago. And my friend said, I said, oh yes, I did. And I was free. A battle? Yes. A challenge? Yes. But the outcome was foreordained by a great, great decision that had been made 15 years earlier when the battle was lost. What is God's will? It is His kingly right and His fatherly desire. What is God's will for us? that none should be lost, and that all of us should bear His character. But does God have a particular will for you and me? And in my counseling with students across the years, this is usually where the issue comes. And I always try to start as I just have. Ah, yeah, okay. Before we talk about that, is there any question about God's will in your life? Because there's no point in talking about who He wants you to marry if He is not truly the King in your life. There's no point in talking about whether He wants you to be a United Methodist or a Christian Missionary Alliance or whatever else if He is not truly your Father. Now, if those questions are settled, then we can begin to talk about these others. Does God care about the critical decisions of your life? Does God have a will in these? Absolutely. Absolutely. But so often, I have the feeling that our images have trapped us. And again, some of you have heard me say these things before. And if so, please forgive me, but maybe you'll remember them the second time. We have this picture of God as the great architect. And He has this huge blueprint. And you are the nut over here on the end of a bolt. And somehow or other you got cross-threaded. So the whole building is sunk 
it's over. You've missed God's perfect will. And you're going to spend the rest of your life on plan B or plan C or plan X. I think that's very unfortunate. God's not an architect. Oh, yes, He is an architect. But He's a lot of other things too. The Bible is very clear. Teach me to do your will. Called to be an apostle by God's will. By God's will, may a way be opened for me to come to you. Those who suffer according to God's will will indeed share His glory. But God is not merely the architect. He is the general. A general has a strategy. He's going to take that city. And then he devises tactics for reaching that goal. The left wing is going to attack first. And as they are fully engaged and the enemy has been sucked over to that side, the right wing will go in and roll them up. And then the center finishes it off. But on the day of the battle, there is a rainstorm. And the ground over here on the left wing is soggy. And so the general changes tactics. Has he changed his ultimate strategy? Oh, no. But he is a good enough general that he can accomplish his strategy with differing tactics. And I want to say the same for you and me. If you have messed up your life, and which of us has not, it's not over. It's not over. We serve the Creator. And the Creator is able to rewrite the plan to achieve the ultimate strategy in your life. He is able to accomplish good even through your failure and your sin. He's that creative. So, you do not need to be paralyzed. Oh my, I I don't know whether this is the girl He wants me to marry or that is the girl He wants me to marry. Yes, you need, I need in those decisions to move forward with the ultimate of prayer saturation. We need to seek the advice of Christian friends. We need to be reading the Word. And it's fascinating how God can speak to us from a passage that we've, not, that we've read many times before. But be very, very careful of impressions. Now, Karen's impressions are much more reliable than mine. It's been frightening over the years. And I'll not give you illustrations. But I remember a point in our lives where I needed to make a decision about graduate school. And it was agonizing. I I could see good possibilities here, and I could see good possibilities there. And I was sharing this with an older person, and he looked at me and smiled and said, you want God to send you a telegram, don't you? And I said, as a matter of fact, yes. (laughs) if God has a will and He wants me to do one of those and doesn't want me to do the other, then He ought to tell me. Well, my advisor didn't answer the question. But as I thought about that over the years, why doesn't God send a telegram? And I came to the conclusion that while one of those might be somewhat preferable to the other, and I believe He led me to the right one. The issue is not 
you must do this or you must do that. The issue was, was I, were we willing to live in faith and to say, Lord, as best we know, this is what we want, you want us to do and we are going to walk forward, not seeing, not with a telegram, but in faith. We want Your will more than anything else. And we are willing to step out in faith in the belief that You are guiding. In our life together, I think we've had every experience of leadership there is. From absolute darkness, where we sat together in the bedroom. Karen was in bed after a very, very difficult delivery with Elizabeth, our first. And we simply talked about the pros and the cons. Her memory was that it was 51% for staying. My memory is it was 51% for going. And we went. (laughs) And she kept her marriage vows, Whither thou goest, I will go. (laughs) We had another experience where God could have written it in the skies. It was that clear. And it was a crucifixion. Does God have a particular will for your life? Yes, He does. And He will reveal it in His own way, in His own time, as you learn to walk in utter, utter dependence upon Him. The question is, is He king? Does He have a right to say to you, Go. And you will go without a quibble. Is He your Father? Does He have the preference in your life by which you will say, Oh, Father, I want above everything else to please You. May it be said of you and of me when we come to the end of the road, I delight to do Thy will. And here I come as is written of me in Your book.